Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's great seeing you all today. Before Secretary McDonough steps to the podium, I wanted to share a couple items with you. First, we continue to process claims and conduct toxic exposure screenings for thousands of veterans across the country. I am personally encouraging all my fellow veterans who may have not received the toxic exposure screening since President Biden signed the PACT Act into law to please learn more at va.gov slash PACT. The toxic exposure screening is easy. I did it myself and has resulted in follow-up testing at my local VA medical center. My hope is you will get your screening as well. Second, we're almost at the one million mark for the Million Veteran Program. The Million Veteran Program is a national research program looking at how genes, lifestyle, military experiences, and exposures affect health and wellness for veterans. Since launching in 2011, more than 950,000 veterans have joined MVP. As a member of MVP myself, I'm asking veterans out there who may want to join this effort to visit mvp.va.gov. Okay, that's all from me for now. And now step aside and turn the floor over to Secretary McDonough. Terrence, uh, thanks very much. Nice to see everybody. Um, let me begin, begin by sharing the story of one of the vets we're privileged to serve, Van Rich. Van has one of the most unique stories I've heard in a while. Served in the Navy, the Navy Reserves, Air Force, and the Air National Guard. Van deployed to Southwest Asia seven times over the course of his 35-year career. 35 years, seven deployments, two different branches, two different reserve components. He was a member of air search and rescue units, saving the lives of his fellow sailors and airmen. And while he was doing that for us, Van was being exposed to toxins. Van remembers seeing the ground change colors as different toxins seeped across the topsoil from the burn pits nearby. Because of that toxic exposure, Van developed what are now presumptive conditions covered by the new toxic exposure law. And as a result, his conditions are now service connected. For Van, the retroactive and monthly toxic exposure benefits are what he calls a big step forward financially. And in his words, a blessing. And while I appreciate that sentiment, it's not a blessing. It's what this country owes Van. It's what he's earned and what he so richly deserves for so courageously serving and sacrificing for this country and for all of us. So that's what we do here. Let me tell you for a moment about one person who does it. Rochelle Montanona, rating, uh, rating veteran service representative in our C Seattle regional office, having served vets for nearly 20 years. Her dad fought three tours in Vietnam. Both of her brothers served in the Army. That tradition of service runs in her family. Not too long ago, Rochelle was reviewing a claim from one of her dad's brothers in arms, a vet who was stationed in Thailand during the Vietnam War and who kept missing his doc doctor's <coughs> exams. And Rochelle needed that exam to make sure the vet got the right rating. She emailed him. She called him. No answers. So she started calling numbers on her, his emergency contact list. Finally got an answer. Because she wouldn't give up on him, the vet made it to his exam. Because she wouldn't give up on him, the vet got the rating he deserved. Because she wouldn't give up on him, the vet's now getting the VA care and benefits he earned and so richly deserved, just like Van. Rochelle sees the new law for toxic exposure as a real game changer for these vets. And she's right. Now, I'm honored to introduce today's guest, guest speaker, Josh Jacobs, VA's newly confirmed undersecretary for benefits. Now, I want to draw your attention to one, actually, to three facts. Fact one, VA hasn't had three concurrently serving Senate-confirmed undersecretaries 
since May 2014. May 2014. In 2014, the VA budget was $154 billion in discretionary and mandatory. In 2023, the VA budget is $309 billion. An increase in that period during which we did not have three concurrently serving Senate confirmed undersecretaries of $155 billion, or 101%. In terms of personnel, in 2014, the budget supported approximately 319,000 people. In 2023, the budget will support approximately 434,000 people, an increase in of 115,000 personnel. So it's critically important that we have confirmed pe personnel in these jobs. So we really appreciate our partner's work on Capitol Hill to get Josh into this fight as a Senate confirmed undersecretary for benefits. Josh, over to you, brother. Uh, thanks, uh, Terrence, and thanks, Secretary McDonough, for your kind words and for placing your trust and confidence in me to serve as undersecretary for benefits. You know, today I want to spend a few minutes to update everyone in the room uh, on the tremendous work and the progress underway in VBA on behalf of our veterans, families, uh, caregivers, and survivors. As you know, VBA set a record last year uh, when it completed over 1.7 million claims, which beat the previous year's record by 12%. We're halfway through the fiscal year, and we're on track to break that record again this year. We've completed 14% more claims today than we did at the same point last year. We've completed over 8,000 claims in a day 39 different times this year. That's something we've only done six times in the rest of VA's history. And just last week, we completed over 9,000 claims in a single day, the first time ever in VA's history. Two weeks ago, we processed our one millionth benefits claim a month earlier than the record we set last year. Thanks to our aggressive hiring, our planning for workload management, our backlog remains under 27% of the total inventory at 213,000 claims as of close of business Saturday. And as a result, we're delivering nearly $3 billion of benefits to more than 6 million veterans, their families, and survivors. And we're doing everything we can to reach out to more veterans so that they can get access to the life-changing benefits that they've earned. Yesterday, we announced that veterans have filed over 500,000 claims for toxic exposure-related conditions under the PACT Act. We've completed more than 241,000 of these claims as of this week, and we've awarded over a billion dollars in earned benefits as a result. And thanks to the PACT Act and our proactive outreach efforts, we've received 31% more claims this year than we did at the same point last fiscal year. That means more veterans and their families will receive an extra bit of financial stability. Many will receive it when they may need it most. And some will gain new or increased access to health care or realize their dream of earning a college degree or even purchasing a home with their earned benefits. So, we're really proud of the role that we play at VBA in helping veterans, their families, and survivors reach their goals, whether they're big or they're small. And we're on pace to achieve so much more. Our loan guarantee service is nearing the historic milestone of delivering the 28 millionth VA guaranteed home loan in the coming weeks. Education claims are being processed on faster timelines, and the new technology that we're rolling out is making enrollments easier than ever. And our insurance service is now the 12th largest life insurer in the United States, and we're continuing to expand after launching the new VA Life Program. Delivering these benefits and more to our veterans wouldn't be possible without our people. So to help meet our increasing demands for VA benefits, we've been aggressively expanding our workforce through hiring fairs and through other avenues. Over the last couple of months, VBA held hiring fairs in eight regional offices, 
we had over 2,800 attendees and almost 1,100 same-day job offers. And as a result of this aggressive hiring, our total workforce is now over 28,000 VBA team members. It's the largest VBA has ever been, and it's the highest growth rate in over a decade, at 15% in the last year and a half. This growth is what's allowing us to deliver more benefits to more veterans than ever before. And while we continue to focus on increasing production and improving the quality of our claims decisions, we're also working with the Veteran Experience Office to look at how we can improve the veteran experience throughout the disability compensation process. So tomorrow, for the first time ever, we're sending out customer experience surveys to veterans who participate in the disability compensation process. And we're gonna work with our VEO partners to turn these key veteran insights into tangible actions that improve the veteran experience. Finally, I wanna encourage all eligible veterans and survivors to file PACT Act claims as soon as possible. If you apply for a PACT Act related benefit on or before August 9th of 2023, your benefits may be backdated to August 10th, 2022, the date the law was enacted. And if you're not ready to submit a claim by then, don't worry. You can also submit an intent to file before August 9th and still potentially re receive that earliest possible effective date. So please visit va.gov forward slash pact or call 1-800-MY-VA-411 and press eight for more information. I'm really looking forward to continuing to serve veterans in this role and building on the past successes of these past months and years. And with that, I will turn it back uh, to Terrence and open it up to questions. Thank you, sir. All right, we'll take questions. We'll start off with Leo. He seemed to call your confirmation before we knew. <laughs> Appreciate that. Um, question for, for both Mr. Secretary and, and Mr. Undersecretary. Um, in reference to those surveys, how, how will that data be used and what, what kind of data are you, you, uh, you pulling from these folks? Is it just a, you know, three quick questions or is it a more comprehensive look at, at what went there? Sure. So we're working with our uh, VEO partners uh, to deploy what they call the V-Signal survey. And we're looking to capture both qualitative and quantitative data. Um, the, the survey contains 13 questions. Uh, it's gonna ask about their filing experience, uh, organizational and platform support they use, whether they're doing it uh, online or through paper, uh, the communication touch points, um, and what level of trust veterans had throughout that process. And the goal here is to take that information and identify both the pain points and the moments that matter so that we can use that information to drive actionable improvements uh, to build trust. Because we know that VBA and the claims process is often the first point that a veteran engages with the department. And it can be the difference between whether or not they decide to pursue the additional earned benefits or uh, access health care or not. And so we're gonna take both the qualitative and the quantitative data uh, that these surveys will provide, along with some of the human-centered research that we've already completed, and we're gonna take that and drive specific projects to make um, tangible improvements to the overall process. And, and veterans who are receiving this, will they be getting it through email? Will they be getting it through the mail? Like, what, what should they be looking for in the next few days? I, I believe it's uh, email. Okay. And then uh, just one other quick question. I, I believe you said it was a 31% increase in the number of, of claims that you received up to this point this year. The hiring numbers you said, obviously those folks were gonna take some time to, mm -hmm. uh, to, to load on and, and get through the whole process. Are you concerned about uh, the issue of burnout at this point with the amount of work going in, with the amount that you're demanding from staff to get through to try and pull down that backlog? Yeah, so I've, um I've been traveling to various regional offices over the last several months. And uh, to uh, every single office that I've visited, I've been incredibly impressed by the, the talent, the dedication to the mission, and the ability to deliver outcomes. You know, the last two years, we've broken all time production records in VBA's history, producing more claims, delivering more benefits to veterans than ever before and our employees are increasing productivity. They are delivering more benefits per person than ever before. And they're doing that 
while the total amount of claims are increasing and they're being asked to process in a very new way. The PACT Act is incredible, but it's changing the way that we uh, operate as an organization. So I am concerned uh, about ensuring that we take care of our veterans because when we take care of veterans or when we take care of our employees, they can take care of veterans. And so we're actively looking at ways that we can uh, protect against burnout, we can provide the support uh, that our employees need and make sure that at the end of the day, uh, the veterans we care for uh, get the uh, benefits that they've earned. Okay, thank you. Next question. You got a question, John? I know, I know. <laughs> you can come up, John. I couldn't see you back there. Hi, sir, sorry. Sorry, uh, thanks for taking my question. Um, I'm afraid I would like to ask about the EHR again, the electronic health record. Um, and I have a question, I guess, more on process than anything else. Um, last week, we had the news of the postponement for the past the future of the rollout of the program. Um, and at the time, we heard again from senior leaders at the agency that issues with the system are being solved. There was an outage last week that happened, and we were told that was solved. Um, and there's another outage that actually came to my attention yesterday over the last week week or so that's, that's also occurred. And I guess my, I really wanted to ask, are you being made aware when these often pretty serious outages are taking place and are they being reported to Congress? Yeah, thanks so much. I, I didn't understand the first thing you said that the, these out, outages were being sold, you said? No, w w when these, we're being told you're Some, being told. Told, I'm I sorry, see. yeah. Sometimes VA officials yeah. will say, you know, I mean, last week, for example, a senior VA official was saying, you know, this outage has been solved, there's not a problem, when actually there was another out separate outage taking place. And I guess I'm really trying to understand what the process is for making sure you and other senior leaders are aware when when, when these medical records aren't available in, in these yeah. institutions. Yeah, great. Thanks so much for the question. So I want to be uh, careful to not... Uh, add a lot to uh, what has been a robust set of briefings in the last week. I think you guys all sat down with Dr. Evans last week. You sat down with Dr. El Nahal earlier this week. I had a couple things to say about this yesterday. So nevertheless, I think you're asking a ver very straightforward question. Um, I'd say two things in response to it. As I said to Congress yesterday, we had had uh, seven months uh, with no outages. That's not to say there had not been degradations, but there had been seven months with no outages. Um, and that's not to say either that degradations aren't, aren't serious. They are very serious. Nevertheless, despite those seven months of no outages, as I testified yesterday, in the last week, we've had two outages, which is the source of great, as I said yesterday, frustration. Uh, so that's the first thing. Uh, and obviously, system reliability is chief among the concerns that Dr. Evans talked with you all about last week, and chief among the concerns as to why we chose the reset. Point two, how do we know about what's happening? Well, uh, we start every day with a uh, morning huddle. In that huddle is the Assistant Secretary for, the, uh, for OINT, Mr. Del Bene, and uh, Dr. Evans, who is running the program office. And so we are given uh, regular updates, including uh, warnings about developments at, that have occurred uh, overnight uh, or even in the, you know, the day prior. Um, so that will give you a sense of that. Thank you. And sorry, just to clarify, those two outages that you referred to there, there's one, the downtime viewer outage, and then yes. the, the other outage from the update last weekend. Those are the two you're referring to there. Uh, you know, I, I, I want to make sure, why don't, why don't we take that question? Sure. So I want to make sure that uh, I don't confuse the issue, but we had a system-wide outage uh, just the day before yesterday uh, that impacted the entire enclave, as we call it, DOD and VA. Uh, and we obviously did have uh, problems with the joint viewer, but I want to make sure that I'm, I'm not uh, 
confusing any of these, so we'll make sure that somebody gets back to you with a specific answer to how you characterize the outages so that I don't mischaracterize them. Thank you, Secretary. W one quick question, if I may, not related to EHR. Um, the VA has been leading on responsible AI and the use of responsible artificial intelligence technologies for um, often to aid uh, with diagnosis. I wondered if you had any thoughts on some of the AI programs that are currently in place in the VA's focus on that technology going forward. I'm really proud of our technologists and I'm really proud of uh, our entire workforce for taking uh, on everything we do, a veteran-centered focus on how we care for veterans, how we develop the claims process. As Josh just said, we're rolling out uh, the V signal in the comp uh, benefits compensation program tomorrow, uh, which is a fundamentally veteran-centered choice. And uh, we expect the same of our technologists as we look at uh, technical innovations and technical improvements. Thanks, Secretary. Thank you. I have a question from Lucy. Good afternoon, Lucy. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for taking my questions. I have a couple, um, if you don't mind. So first of all, um, see, welcome, Mr. Jacobs. I just wanted to know if, if you're going to be the person that will be heading the, um, the, the equity team or if you all are waiting uh, to have him in position to start naming the members of that equity team. That is my first question. Yeah, so why don't I uh, take that, Lucy, and then obviously if Josh wants to pile on, he can. Um, yeah, we're, we're not, as I uh, told you last time we talked about this, uh, we are building that team. We're uh, doing a full scrub of our, our records and our processes. Um, we don't ha yet have an announcement on who those people will be on the team, uh, but we owe, respons we owe responses on that to a lot of important people, starting with the President of the United States and our veterans and to you. So when we have announcements on that, we'll let you know for sure. Okay, a couple more questions for you, sir. Um, I just wanted to know as well, um, one of our NBC stations has been doing a 20-year investigation into flawed neurological exams at the Toma VA. Uh, one, are you aware of the level of examination that has been offered through the years to these veterans and that the uh, House Veteran uh, Committee is basically investigating this at this point? And do you have a sense of the extent of these flawed neurological exams in TOMA that have led to the misdiagnosis of traumatic brain injury through the years? Yeah, thanks so much. I'm familiar with the reporting because it's my hometown uh, news reporting organization. And I've been to the Toma facility, uh, and we're following this issue very closely. I've discussed it with the congressman from that area, Mr. Van Orden, with Senator Baldwin, who has been focused on this uh, very much and had exchange with her yesterday about it. Uh, we are very concerned about uh, the CMP exams. We're looking at uh, the full range of CMP exams as well as uh, uh, um, care provided uh, in um, the Toma facility, and you know, we, I don't have a specific, uh, I don't have any broader announcement than that. But am I aware of it? The answer to that is yes. Uh, I'm intimately familiar with it, uh, and we're staying on top of this to ensure that uh, our veterans get the care that they have earned and that they deserve, and that any veteran who got uh, a CMP exam that is not up to our standard has the right uh, to have a review of that without compensating uh, his effective date or her effective date, uh, meaning they should not have to refile a claim. So we're working this very closely with the congressional delegation, uh, and as we have more news to share on that, we will. Uh, just one more on that, and then one other question, sir. Um, Mr. Secretary, you can tell me about the the procedure in the past, they have said before it would be corrected. And there was reporting done saying that essentially what you, you had just said, we we're aware we're going to fix this. And then years passed and we were seeing that this was still happening. Is there anything that you can say about how the accountability process will look different to make sure that the doctors that aren't um, well equipped, well trained, well certified, appropriately certified, so that they are taken out of the situation when it comes to diagnosing veterans? Yeah, uh, thanks. So 
Um, obviously, can't speak to uh, what had happened before I was here, before Josh was here, before Dr. Elna Hall was here. Um, but we take the CNP exam, the compensation and pension exam, uh, very seriously. And uh, f to his great good credit, Josh Jacobs, whom I call today Under Secretary Jacobs, uh, has insisted on higher quality metrics, incentives, and uh, disincentives for uh, those CNP exams uh, during his time uh, as he's in the acting role. Um, and so, and while I want to be careful not to comment about an ongoing situation, I can say to you that if we had reason to believe somebody was not providing quality care either in the clinical setting or in CNP exams, we would make sure that they were not carrying those functions out. And I stand by that uh, as a general matter, and I want our veterans to have the assurance that we will make that uh, so whenever we're presented with that situation. And then final question for you, sir, or Mr. Jacobs, if you want to take it. Um, I understand that it is National Infertility Week, and this is a question that isn't just for the, uh, the families, the military families, but really for all of the programs um, and their leaders that, that are worried about the budget cuts um, that were just announced with the, with the latest announcement of the, uh, the debt ceiling. But one of the things that um, I understand is going on right now before Congress is the military families fighting for an expansion of coverage for IVF, ART, yeah. uh, adoption, third-party reproduction. Yes. Obviously, as military families, we know it's even harder to bring a child into this world um, when your other half is gone all the time. And then just the process of getting um, that kind of coverage and then services connected, if you can prove that your um, infertility issues was because of your service, and even if it wasn't, it, it seems like it's just lagging much more behind uh, what the civilians get through their uh, health insurance, depending on who your employer is and what the plan is. So can you just elaborate on the focus on helping military families with this disparity and what is covered for growing their families when their partner is gone so much of the year? Yeah, thanks so very much for the question. Um, this is an issue that has uh, been a priority for us since we arrived. Uh, in each of his budget submissions, President Biden has tried to change the limitations on VA in the uh, types of uh, services that we can provide families uh, and as it relates to um, uh, infertility services or fertility services. Uh, we are going to fight until we get this enacted. Uh, I've talked at length with many members of Congress for whom this is also a major priority, uh, and I hope that we get there. Um, but your characterization of the situation uh, is accurate, meaning that uh, there are limitations on services that VA can provide to include to legally married same-sex couples uh, that we think are not in keeping with our requirements to care for all veterans. And we have sought to have this changed. We will continue to seek to have it changed until we can provide veterans the full suite of services that uh, they have earned and so richly deserve. Thank you, sir. And Terrence, last question, I promise you. Um, the the numbers that you all just released uh, that Melissa Chan from our organization reported on, the record number of calls to the uh, suicide hotline as we ramp up to cover Memorial Day and another round of analyzing these numbers. Can you tell us, and also Mission Daybreak, just awarding to um, Stop Soldier Suicide, what is the implementation going to look like when people are calling that hotline now? And now that you've awarded your Mission Daybreak uh, grant winners, what does it look like on the ground, especially with, especially in the special ops community that just suffered three in the last two weeks? What do you say to these people? Uh, thank you very much for the question. Uh, obviously, uh, 
ending veteran suicide is our number one clinical priority in VA. The use of the veteran crisis line is a critical tool in that. And in fact, as you said, veterans called, texted, and messaged the hotline 88,092 times in March 2023. That is the most in the history of the hotline. This increase in contacts means that veterans in crisis are getting the help they need at the moment they need it. It's really important uh, that our performance statistics on fielding those calls, uh, on making sure that veterans are not waiting an inordinate period on the line as they make those calls, and then that they are connected to services, especially if they're in crisis, that day when they call the line, uh, we have continued to perform on those metrics. So even at the highest month that we've had, we've continued to perform to ensure that vets get connected to somebody with training and some uh, clinical experts and then get them into care, including that day, if they need it. Now, there is a question around why the number is as high. And I think one of the things that uh, motivates your question, Lucy, and one of the things that was in your colleagues reporting was an attribution for why. The fact is, there is no one factor that fully explains the increase. Many factors influence increases in calls to the veteran crisis line. There are, however, some clear trends that we've identified. First, seasonality. Year over year, we've consistently seen increases in contacts in the month of March, including similar spikes in 2020, 2021, and 2022. Seasonal patterns of variation over time incur, occur in other parts of the year as well. So that's one. Two, the, second, the, the shortened hotline number, 2988, any veteran in crisis, please just dial 988 and then touch one and we'll get you care. Since that, there has been routinely more veterans reaching the crisis line. Since the launch of 988 and subsequent advertising and awareness campaigns, there has been a consistent increase in veteran crisis line calls of 12% for calls, 36% increase for texts, and a 10% increase for chat messages across the board. We've also been aggressively reaching out to veterans, including in the special ops community that you've just talked about, in media, in advertising, and in person to raise awareness for this simplified hotline number. This has resulted in significant increases for VCL volume, just as it has, according to Secretary Becerra and HHS, for the National 988 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline, which fields calls across the country outside the veteran crisis line. So again, uh, there are many reasons that this is happening now. Um, point one, point two, this increase in calls has not meant any diminution of services, and it has not meant any slowness in responding, which means three, as a veteran, if you are in crisis, please contact us at 988, then press one, and we'll make sure that we get you into care today. Thanks. Thank you, Bill. Ellen. Thank you all for doing this. I'm interested in research today. Well, you indicated there are 950,000 veterans signed up for the MVP already. Yes. 
How many of them have completed their DNA testing and analysis so that they're fully in the biobank? Yeah, I can get those specific numbers back to you. So uh, let me follow up with the MVP team and I'll get that okay. to you hopefully by the end of the day. Okay, appreciate it. Okay, the um, new Gulf War illness uh, study that y'all are doing with NIH, when will you start being, enrolling veterans into that? That's, unless you know, that's probably another one I need to look into, Ellen, so we'll circle back on that too. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Ellen. <laughs> Jory. As always for doing this. Uh, VBA question, following up on some remarks from earlier this year, Under Secretary uh, Jacobs just wanted to keep an eye on the um, efforts under VBA to uh, automate uh, claims processing. I know that there was an update back in February on that. Just in terms of the, the claims that are being processed under that, how are things going? Is there a, a push to you know, widen the scope of claims that are being automated at VBA? Thanks very much for the question. Uh, I think this is one of the most exciting areas uh, of work going on in VBA at the moment. You know, we talked a lot about the hiring and we're continuing to push very, very hard to hire more new VBA employees. But the promise of the automated decision support uh, technology is that we can help our employees deliver more benefits to more veterans more equitably and accurately and consistently than ever before. So. We're uh, actively working through that uh, and using, uh, at eight regional offices, getting direct feedback from frontline employees to test and provide feedback uh, on that. I was just in Montgomery, uh, uh, one of the eight sites that is actively um, testing our uh, automated decision support uh, tools and got some really great feedback, got the demo. Uh, there are some really fantastic features that are already directly improving the, the speed to complete certain portions of the claims process. And we've seen other ways where there's additional promise, but we need to change the, the automation logic. And so we're actively working and there's, as you would expect, the tension between the need to continue to innovate and uh, expand the aperture of the, the number of employees who can use this technology while also dealing with the, the near-term immediate needs to produce uh, decisions for veterans right away. And so uh, there is robust collaboration uh, underway across the entire organization, uh, making sure that as we deploy, further deploy this technology, that we're making appropriate policy, regulatory, or pursuing statutory changes that, that may be needed. And we're also working with our employees because we wanna make sure as we provide these tools that they're actually gonna be adopted and used across the system and not uh, incentivize some sort of workaround. So a lot of great progress and still plenty more to do. Mm -hmm. And going back to the, the, high, the job fairs, the hiring, mm -hmm. the, the, the effort being there in the workforce, um, you know, something we always track, of course, is the time to hire, how quickly people mm -hmm. from, who are interested in the job are able to get in the door and start working at the EBA. In terms of the metrics there, are things improving? Are they currently where you'd like them to be? Just a, an update there would be great. Yeah, I, I can get back to you with the specific details uh, and the stats, but I think generally speaking, we're doing quite well with the 80-day um, the time to hire kind of onboarding process. One of the things that we've done, and we're always looking to kind of shrink that time, is we, uh, through these hiring fairs, we've learned along the way what works and what doesn't, and so we're continuing to streamline and improve the process, and our ability to provide these same-day hires has been absolutely phenomenal. Um, still pushing very hard to keep uh, shrinking that process. And then the important thing is not only getting them, getting these new employees onboarded, but we also need to get them trained. And so we're working very hard to align the timing of our hiring actions with the, tiring, the timing of the classes that each of these new employees goes through because we wanna make sure we build the skills that are necessary to do this very complex and important work. So uh, I'm, I'm pretty pleased with uh, the, the level of effort and the outcome so far and continuing to push the team to, to work uh, even faster uh, and more diligently because everyone understands our ability to do this directly impacts our ability to serve veterans. Mm -hmm. Something we've seen across the entire federal workforce now is that right mix of in-person work and virtual work and of course with the healthcare side of VA that's 
not really as much of an option, but with the better fit side of things, I'm just curious, is there still flexibility being offered there in terms of you know, new and current employees? Uh, you know, is, is telework still an option for them? Just what's the current state of yeah. play there? Our VBA employees, for the most part, are complying with the OPM requirement of uh, being in the office two days per pay period. I think what we've demonstrated as an organization over the last two years is we've been able to increase production and increase productivity, notwithstanding the challenges associated of, with the very quick pivot to this largely virtual uh, operation. And so I'm, um, I'm confident that the team will continue to produce uh, no matter uh, what happens in the future. Uh, the VBA workforce uh, is represented by uh, more than 55% of our employees are veterans. All of them are veteran advocates, and so I know no matter what happens, they're going to do the job. Okay, and Mr. Secretary, I did want to follow up on your remarks yesterday on Capitol Hill. Sure. Uh, regarding the EHR and the budgeting, you said that there's about $400 million in the FY 2023 budget that just given the reset and the current reality of things with the EHR, uh, probably not going to use this year. You know, does that money go back to Congress? Is is lawmakers able to kind of you know repurpose that so you guys are spent, able to spend that elsewhere within VA? Just what's the, the current situation with that that funding? Yeah, thank, thanks for the thanks for the question. Um, I want I want to just go back uh, on two things that you just talked to Josh about. Uh, one is on workforce uh, because of the centrality of people. To our ability to perform against the numbers that you've se you've seen from Josh and that you heard about from Sharif earlier this week, um, hiring time to hiring time for onboarding are really important metrics for us. So we're working through a process here to be very transparent with you all on what that looks like. In the same way that we're putting out the Pact Act performance dashboard, uh, we'll be looking uh, to some some kind of similar set of regular measurements that we'll make public for you all to consume that. On the future of work as we're calling it, um, I just gotta say again how proud I am of the VA workforce for the performance that they've had throughout the pandemic. You saw those numbers from Josh on his charts earlier. I think you've seen the numbers that we've produced as it relates to uh, veteran care at VHA, uh, and then uh, caring for veterans uh, through our national cemeteries. Um, we've continued to operate at a very high level at VA um, throughout the pandemic. Uh, consistent with a call from OMB uh, recently to see a substantial increase in uh, workforce in headquarters elements, we are working very closely uh, with our leaders, our supervisors here in the National Capital Region uh, to uh, make sure that we are meeting uh, and leading on the standards that OMB has called for. I will say though, in the field, as you your question envisioned, our personnel, VHA, VBA, NCA, are so uh, productive uh, we are going to make sure that they can continue to operate the way they're operating now. Now, on the 400 million, that's a, the, what happens with the 400 million will be something that obviously we'll work through with Congress. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, the, this, there, there are a series of uh, benchmarks laid out in statute, including on you know, when we uh, unlock certain parts of uh, the set aside mon uh, money for this year. Uh, so in that process, we'll work out precisely what happens, but that's for something for us to work out with Congress. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess, like you said yesterday, for FY24, that still remains in Same flux. Same thing. We're going to work that through uh, with Congress, but what we're going to do, remember what we're focused on here is getting it right at the five sites. Okay. Thanks okay. so much. Thank you. Over to Quill. Good afternoon, Quill. Hey, good afternoon. Nice to see you all. Um, uh, thanks very much for all of the uh, people you've offered up to explain the EHR situation. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I just wanted to give you a chance to uh, address a couple of very general issues because this is the first time we've had a chance to talk to you about it since the, uh, the pause was announced. Um, can you talk directly to the veterans who live and who get their care at those five sites, plus, I guess, Northern Chicago, about 
why why they should why they're continuing on this system which uh, has been frozen because it hasn't performed well uh, some of them tell me they feel like guinea pigs i just want to give you a chance to address that and tell them why it's safe for them to be uh, getting their care under this current system um, i have a couple of follow-ups but i'll just let good you why don't you why don't you give me them all and then i can hit them okay yeah i mean the the next logical question is if um, if you're keeping this system, which has been so frustrating, uh, does it not leave you in a position in negotiating with Cerner where it already seems like vendor lock? If, uh, if the VA is an offering uh, and doesn't seem to be able to switch back to Vista or uh, show a clear alternative of what it will do without Cerner, um, what leverage does that give you? Mm -hmm. And then the third one really is just do you have an idea about what went wrong or what has gone wrong in a general way? I, I'm still hearing about Cerner uh, uh, officials who are still learning the very basics of how the VA system works now, uh, five years into the contract and uh, two decades into this process. So uh, really just what went wrong? What's your understanding of what has mm -hmm. gone wrong so far? Just very general questions. Yeah, thanks so much. Uh, so I'm going to go like two, three, one, if that's okay. Um, you know, uh, we're working through the contract with Oracle Cerner. It's, uh, very little I can say about that. Um, but what's really important here is, uh, as I've said, for me, since you're asking me personally, uh, two things are of vital importance. Um, uh, obviously, patient safety uh, and patient outcomes and user satisfaction. Those two issues are largely informed in my experience now, uh, over the last two years, by system reliability and by training. So what went wrong uh, is I think uh, we have not seen suitable reliability and we've not seen uh, the kind of training, again, this is my, this is Dennis's view, not seeing the training that we uh, had come to expect and that I think you've reported on and others in the room have reported on. So as we negotiate uh, this contract, we'll want to see greater accountability in particular around those two areas. So that goes to the, the issue of what went wrong and the contract. So uh, we'll keep working the contract, and, and um, you know I think we feel like uh, so we'll, we'll keep working the contract. Uh, to our veterans in those five sites, and to our uh, healthcare providers there, I re was recently in Roseburg, Oregon. I was really appreciative of the time that the team made for me quite early one morning uh, to share their experience and, and to share uh, the things that I can do uh, to be a better partner to them. Uh, I say to uh, them that uh, we continue to believe, as all of healthcare does, that there's real power in health, care, health record modernization. Uh, it unleashes, uh, when done effectively, important benefits in terms of patient safety and patient outcomes which is our number, our number one priority here. And importantly, allowing us to interface with DOD will uh, not only improve uh, patient outcomes, but will improve our ability to resolve benefits questions that much faster. So that's the promise of uh, the record. Uh, we intend to implement in a very veteran-centered veteran way with patient safety and patient outcomes leading uh, our principled implementation of it um, 
we intend to deliver those outcomes. Just briefly, can you tell the veterans in those sites how you're plussing up the support, uh, what you're able to do to make their experience safer and, and better uh, while they are, I guess, the, the laboratory for the development of this? Well, you know, I, 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 we're, we're working that through with our uh, providers uh, in the facilities and the uh, program office is leading that charge, Quill, so I'm going to leave that to them uh, to do that. But what we're, what we're making clear in the context of this reset is that the most important thing that matters here is making it work in those five sites driven by the principles of patient safety and improved veteran, out, uh, veteran patient outcomes. And that's the way we're going to pursue this. Thanks a lot. Orion. Thank you guys for doing this. As, as always, first, I just want to take the opportunity, since Leo's here, to say go Mariners. We haven't scored yet, but that's normal, so we're fine. Um, <laughs> I, and I appreciate the questions from other reporters uh, on the HR and, of course, the chance to talk with uh, Dr. Evans and Dr. Ellenhall about this. So I'm not going to ask. I'm just going to ask about a few particular things, uh, Mr. Secretary. Uh, VA told me in a statement that the contract with Oracle Cerner does not allow the company to monetize veterans' health records without the express written permission of, of VA. So I just have to ask, has VA given that permission? I'm going, to, I'm going to take the questions because over here, I think this is like a bad spot here. Who, who said, somebody said what again? I just got in a statement from your press team this morning uh, that uh, I'd asked if VA has ever, if, if Oracle Cerner has monetized, has, you know, has used uh, the veteran health records they received from VA uh, through the EHRM process to uh, make money in any way to monetize that data. I was told that uh, that can only happen with VA's express written permission. Uh, so I just have to ask, to your knowledge, has that permission been given to, to my, Oracle? To my, to my knowledge, no, but I'll find out for certain uh, whether it has. And there, and I, there's no circumstance under which I would allow that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, have you had any direct communication with Secretary Austin about the shared challenges between, like you say, the federal enclave in terms of uh, these recent outages that affected on DOD? The most recent outages, I have not, no. In the past, you have uh, generally on the on We've the talked EHR? generally about uh, EHR as we talk about a lot of different things, but I have not talked specifically about uh, the most recent uh, challenges. Thank you. And I just want to ask you a, a question that uh, Senator Murray asked yesterday, um, and I know it's tough to answer. You've, you've sort of, uh, this has been posed a few times, but in terms of productivity, because there's been a lot of talk about patient safety, of course, uh, about some of the other impacts of the, the EHR, but productivity has been reduced at the affected facilities. They're seeing fewer veterans than they were prior to the new EHR being deployed. And as a result, of course, those veterans are either deferring care or they're going to private uh, providers Correct. through community care, um, where often they face long delays. So. How much longer can those veterans expect uh, to wait before productivity is, is restored at those sites? Um, you know, I, uh, I guess I want to say two things. One, I want to say I, the best thing to do is to take my answer from yesterday because I was sp speaking to the chairman of the Appropriations Committee. And well, I, I just you know, asked because you didn't actually so, answer that part of her question, uh, so I had to repeat and it. And the second thing I'd say is uh, we're resolving this as quickly as we possibly can, right? And um, we're doing it, uh, as I said, in, in a very, in a, as we do everything around here, a veteran-centric way to ensure um, patient safety and best veteran outcomes. And so um, we continue to, to work to ensure timely access to world-class care, uh, and we'll continue to do that. But uh, I think that's how I'd answer the question. I'll leave it there. Thanks. Thanks. Rebecca, good afternoon. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Rebecca. Okay, great. Um, thanks for doing this. Um, 
So obviously there's been a lot of focus this week on how the uh, Republican debt limit and uh, spending cut plan could affect veterans. Um, and the bill itself, while it has the top line spending cap, does not specifically cut VA. Um, and I understand that the math to get to that cap would be really hard without cutting VA. It is theoretically possible. So do you have a response to the Republicans who have been accusing uh, the administration of fear-mongering and lying when it talks about these possible cuts to VA? Um, I, I'm, I, I'm not familiar with the, the, the last part of your question. So I guess I, if there's something for me to say to uh, my our Republican uh, colleagues on the Hill, I'll say that to them personally, and, and uh, you know, as I always do, and I keep an open line with them. So I don't. I, I guess I'm, I'm uh, a little I trepidatious think, about answering the question when you say, you know, yeah. hey, what do you think about somebody saying you're lying? So let me answer the question analytically, and then if there's something that I need to say to my colleagues, I'll, I'll obviously reach out to them as I always do, and and and. Uh, Really appreciate the open and clear and respectful channel we have there. Um, I've read the provisions uh, that they're debating, uh, and uh, it does carve out the Department of Defense expressly so, um, but does not carve out anybody else. So a fair reading of that would suggest that we, as we prepare uh, for the provision of care, uh, into next year, be ready for the full range of options, the full range of outcomes. And that's what we're doing. And we're working with OMB to do that. Uh, and as with everything else, I'm going to be very transparent with you all about that. And so, um, in as much as uh, the bill did not choose to do for VA what it chose to do for DOD means. We need to pretend. We need to prepare ourselves uh, for uh, the outcomes of the type that we've been uh, very candid uh, in writing, in testimony, and in private conversations with uh, Capitol Hill, as well as uh, with all of you, about what those potential outcomes would be. So, to your mind, it is a very real possibility that. Um, these 22% cuts will come to pass, um, that you will not be able to um, persuade lawmakers to save VA funding, if you will. Again, I, I, I just want to tell you my position without, I'm, I, you, I, I'm not really sure I understand how you're asking the question, so I want to just tell you my position. I read the bill, and the bill does not carve VA out of the potential cuts. Mm -hmm. The bill does carve DOD out of the potential cuts in as much as they chose to do that for DOD but did not for VA. Leads me as a leader of this organization and one who considers himself a prudent leader to need to prepare for very real cuts. That's why we've uh, stacked these up. That's why we've done the analysis to be uh, sure that uh, members understand that and that we begin to prepare for that. All right, thank you. Any further questions? Well, sir, this does it for the month of April. Thank you, Mr. Jacobs, for joining us this I'm afternoon. Sorry, I'm sorry, Under Secretary Jacobs. <laughs> the Honorable Under Secretary, yeah. Mr. Thank Jacobs, thank you, sir, for joining us today. It's a Thanks pleasure. Everybody. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next month.